What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Two Pop to Handle. I'm your host, Andrew Nucatola, your pop culture best friend. And as always, I hope you guys are having a fabulous week. I hope you all had fabulous Memorial Days. Isn't it just so fabulous, for lack of a better word, to have a three-day weekend? Like, we really need, I don't know who we need to talk to to get more three-day weekends, but put me in contact. I will fully spearhead the campaign to, like, at least one three-day weekend a month. I think year round, just once a month, an extra Monday off just to give us that extra little serotonin boost. You know what I mean? Like just to give us that extra day, whether it's to recover from a Sunday hangover, whether it's to get some chores done, whether it's to rot on your couch. Like I don't really care what you do with the day, but I just let me know who I need to talk to about getting more holiday weekends because I don't think there's enough and I don't think it's asking for too much for like an extra day just to like you know be silly or do whatever you want for the day. <laughs> that being said it was a fabulous Memorial Day over here. We will get into that in just a moment but before we get into a weekend recap there was a little excitement over here at the Two Pop to Handle headquarters last week after I finished recording. We have to get into it because I now officially have internet beef with Quinta Brunson. Okay, like not really, but kind of. So <laughs> if you did not see, let me paint the picture. So last week I finished the episode. I'm exporting. I am doing my thing, just waiting for everything to load. And I decided to check my phone. And now before I recorded, I checked TikTok because I'm chronically online and addicted to my phone, my screen time. I know, I know, I know. But I checked TikTok before I started recording and there was nothing unordinary. Things were, you know, people were seeing the videos, doing this, doing that. Nothing to note film the episode, do my thing. I'm exporting. I'm chit-chatting with Thomas. And then I open TikTok and I see like a, a bigger number of notifications than usual. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like something must have popped off while I was recording. Little did I know that Miss Quinta Brunson, Janine Teagues herself, stitched a video responding to one of the podcast clips that I posted. So if you listened, I think it was had to be two episodes, maybe three episodes ago now, I sent out a little PSA to Quinta Brunson, just letting her know that if she did not have Janine and Gregory get together by the end of season three of Abbott Elementary, I was going to do something drastic. And I meant it. I, I'm standing by what I said. And I spoiler, if you have not watched the finale, she did not disappoint. We don't know where they're going, but at least they took the first step into being together in the finale. And I will leave it at that. But the message was received loud and clear by Miss Brunson. She stitched the video and she was like, so if you say drastic, what exactly do you mean? Just like a perfect, typical Quinta Brunson reaction. Spunky, quirky, funny, in on the joke, you know. I literally, I could have collapsed. So she posts it, she does it, we watch the finale, all is well. And then I wake up the next morning and the video is deleted. So I don't know why. I don't know if Quinta went in and deleted her response. I Maybe I'm being delusional and f call me out if I am. I'm probably not going to listen, but call me out anyway. I don't think she would have like gone in and deleted it herself. You know, like I don't think she would have stitched it, posted it, done her thing, and then gone back. It had to be like six hours later and deleted because it was getting a lot of traction. It had a lot of views, a lot of likes on her page. It was getting a lot on mine too, but mainly on her video because she's Quinta Brunson. So I don't think that she went in and deleted it herself just because she wanted to be like funny. I genuinely think it was either like TikTok because in retrospect, I guess I was threatening something in the video and she was kind of like questioning it, you know, in that sense. And they're very strict on TikTok about any type of like threats or, you know, safety violations, things like that. And obviously Quinta Brunson has hundreds of thousands if not millions of followers so it had a lot more eyes on it than my video or I think maybe somebody from the network was like hey that's not really the best message to send over a tv show which like just call me dramatic I know but that being said again I don't think Quinta like went in and deleted it no hard feelings not that she's ever listening to this or cares but she did, you know, it's down. It is what it is. I'm still honored that she was able to see and hear my message and send one back. And like I said, mother delivered. She came through. It was a fantastic finale of season three. If you have not watched this show, I don't know how many episodes of this podcast you're going to listen to until you finally agree to watch Abbott Elementary. But with that being said, Quinta Brunson, you will always be famous. I love you and I cannot wait for season four. I know it just ended, 
but I'm already counting down for summer vacation to be over for these teachers so we can see what happened with Janine and Gregory because like, holy shit. <sighs> Hello? I can't. Such a good finale, such a good season. If you do anything besides leave me a five-star rating from this podcast, watch Abbott Elementary. <laughs> So that was Wednesday. Thursday went on as typical behavior. And then the weekend came. Saturday we spent in the city. And let me tell you, there is nothing better than New York City on a holiday weekend because nobody is here. Everybody flees, everybody leaves, and it is like a giant children's playground to just do whatever you want. There's no waits at any restaurants, no waits at any bars. It is literally heaven. And I'm probably giving away secrets, but like, it is so nice to be in Manhattan or just the city in general, really, on a holiday weekend when everybody leaves because there's no one here. Fabulous. I went to the Central Park. Thomas, my best friend Ashley and I, we just went, hung out. We brought some drinks. We brought some food. We played some Uno. Just like a fabulous little Saturday in the park. We ended it with espresso martinis and pickle martinis, which is my one of my favorite drinks in the city at Penrose on the Upper East Side. I feel like I've talked about them a ton on the podcast. So if you don't already know, you've got to add Penrose to your list of places to go. Their espresso and pickle martinis are literally to die for. And I, they're probably in like my electric chair meal. Like if it came down to it, they're like, what's your last drink you would have? It would be a pickle martini from Penrose, no questions asked. So we ended the night there because then the next day, Sunday, we got some last minute planned. We had to throw something together because, you know, we were late on figuring things out, but we ended up going out to Long Island and spending the day, I guess the night too, with one of my other best friends, Crystal, and Ashley tagged along some last minute plans thrown together. And we ended up heading out east, going to Long Island for a Sunday. So yes, I do love the city on a holiday weekend, but I also wanted to get a little Memorial Day vibes out out east. So we headed out east, just hung out. It was so much fun, so fabulous. Just good to like go out and you know we got like the best of both it was kind of like I spent my weekend with divorced parents I did like my old stomping grounds out on Long Island I did my new stomping grounds here in New York it was just fabulous so much fun and we came back Monday it was hell on earth taking the Long Island Railroad back but you know what it is what it is I'm not here to bore you guys with how miserable the MTA and the Long Island Railroad are we all already know that so yes that was my weekend pride month is quickly approaching like rapidly approaching it is literally this saturday and i'm like oh we are it really is just like full speed ahead into summer bus club another club no sleep non-stop so <laughs> very excited to see what this summer has in store should be fun should be fabulous should be you know it should be too pop to handle, dare I say. <laughs> and with that being said, I think it's time to hop in to some of our segments. And our first segment is going to be very quick because there was no new music last week. So if you are new here, I start every show with my Drew releases. So my new music releases from last week and then the new music coming up this week. And for the first time in like three or four months, there is no releases from last week or this week to talk about. Honestly, feels kind of nice. As much as I love new music, there's been so much new music that I will take any Friday we can get to just like have a breather, marinate in the music that has been out already. I listened to Cowboy Carter the other day for the first time like fully through in like probably a month and it's not even that I don't want to listen to it. It's just like there has been so much going on that I'm like I I need to try to keep up with all the new releases and I've been listening to like my favorites from Cowboy Carter obviously here and there but like not a full listen through which is really the best way to experience that album and I did it the other day and I was like I am so overcome with so much music that I literally have not listened to this body of work in way too long so I need to like get better at my my balance of rotation of new music you know what I mean I feel like there's so much that has come out this year and it's like coming and going so quick but there's so much good music so much to soak up. So we have another week to soak up those releases that maybe we didn't get around to. Maybe we wanted some more time with. There are some big releases coming in June. We have Charlie, Normani, and then there's some big releases that are kind of like on the horizon. We don't have a date yet, but they are part of the show. So we will talk about them in just a bit, but put a pin in that for now. We'll get back to it. And I think, I think with that, let's just hop into some other pop culture news because that's what we're here to do. Kicking off the show with some concert news, which like really is some of my favorite news to talk about because you guys know I love my live music. BBC Radio 1's big weekend was this weekend over in the UK, which essentially just like a big music festival. They had Charlie XCX, Sabrina Carpenter, Coldplay, 
Ali Alexander, tons of different artists, so much fun. And the real big story coming out of the weekend is Sabrina Carpenter's outro for Nonsense. Now, if you guys have been listening for a while, you guys know how I feel about Sabrina Carpenter's Nonsense outros. I absolutely love them. I hope she never stops doing them. I think literally last week it was like putting out, a, I was like begging essentially for her to never stop doing them because I love them so much. And she just doesn't disappoint. She just continues to outdo herself. And this one, this one was a little ballsy, even for Sabrina Carpenter. So if you remember, let's rewind a bit. A few months ago, she did the BBC Lounge where she did the nonsense outro and made a uh, not so secretive sexual innuendo to the term BBC. Obviously, the double play on words over over in the UK and then compared to here, which if you don't know what BBC stands for in the US, just uh, Urban Dictionary it. I'll leave that up to you and to your discretion. But she got some heat for it. She was in the news. People were not happy with her, I guess, profanity and like alluding to that, which like grow up. Come on. <laughs> so this festival being hosted by BBC, she decided to kind of you know, dip her toes back into the water and just like have some fun with it. So she said, and I quote, BBC said I should keep it PG. BBC, I wish I had it in me. There's a double meaning if you dig deep. And I mean, Sabrina Carpenter is Sabrina Carpentering. She is so funny. She's in on the joke. She doesn't really give a fuck what people think about her. And I love it. I think this is so funny. A little cheeky, a little naughty, still funny, you know. And it's one of those things like you could hear this and just like understand it as is but also like if you know about the little controversy a few months ago it makes it even funnier to add a little little fuel to the fire so I loved that there was a lot of talk online people being like I imagine being Barry and hearing this and saying she wish she had the BBC when he clearly does not have a BBC um and to that I'm just like I don't think a 30 something year old man is that hurt by a 15 second outro of a song where like she's clearly just like having fun I think he's a-okay and like secure enough in their relationship to be worrying about the fact that like Sabrina's singing about BBC on stage. I think like we're good and if he's not that seems like a him problem. You're a big boy. You can handle it. And with that yeah that was our BBC news. Nothing too crazy. Charlie XCX actually before I move on Charlie XCX's set looked so major and it is making me so much more excited to see her in like two or three weeks, I'm going to the Brooklyn show. I don't have tickets for Sweat later this year with Troy, but again, I will be there. But I am seeing her in a few weeks and I am so excited. This album, Brat, is going to be so major to me. And I just, I can't wait. I cannot wait to listen to it. Can't wait for this era, this album. Honestly, kind of one of the best album rollouts we've had this year. She is kind of just like continuously killing it from like the features, the music video to like the remixes to just like everything she's doing is so smart. She is teasing a remix with Robin and Young Lean, who I'm not familiar with, but obviously Robin is Robin. So she's doing a 360 remix with them. I'm assuming actually, now that I think about it, that will probably come out this Friday. So I guess we will have new music this Friday, but it's kind of like, it's new music, but it's not because it's a remix. You know what I mean? Uh, that being said, very excited for Charlie. Her set looked insane at this festival and just got me so much more excited to see her soon. And that is our BBC Big Weekend news. Moving on to some other concert news. Boston Calling was this weekend, which if you don't know what Boston Calling is, is essentially GovBall in New York to Boston is like Coachella light diet Coachella if you will and I say that with love that is not like shade or anything it's just like the truth uh and they had some some issues on Sunday so they had some big names this weekend performing though they had Renee there Chapel was there uh the Killers were there Megan the Stallion was there Ed Sheeran was there like it was a very it was a pretty solid lineup I have to say but Sunday was kind of a shit show and there was two concert things to talk about this week about just like shit show crowd control first and foremost sunday's boston calling whatever you want to call it mishap so i was talking to one of my friends andrea so hey girl if you're listening and she was there so i was like what is going on this weekend like what is happening because they said that chapel's set literally had more people at it than the headliners did all three nights put like that is insane. So I was texting her and she said she was like at six o'clock at the main stage. It was literally a third packed on Saturday compared to what it was Sunday at four. Now Boston Calling has put out a statement and they've said, you know, our safety of our fans is always most important. We are always looking out. We did not oversell. But like 
if you saw the crowd shot from Sunday, that crowd was crazy. Not that Chaparron doesn't deserve the biggest crowd possible because she really is like the most exciting thing in music right now. But like, that was nuts. And whatever went down with Boston Calling, if they sold too many tickets for Sunday or like whatever the vibe was, if were people just like didn't know how to handle themselves. I didn't see anything of people like passing out or getting hurt, things like that. It might have happened, didn't come across my desk, but I feel like it would have, I would have seen it. It's usually a big deal when things like that happen at festivals because it is such like a safety thing, you know, and I didn't see anything like that. So hopefully, you know, knocked on wood that everyone was safe, but it just looked like hell on earth. And I just think it was like poor crowd control, which at this point in the culture, there is no reason for like poor crowd control at a concert. We've been doing this on such large scales for so long, which leads me into my next point of the fact that like Taylor Swift's Lisbon show was kind of a mess. It was night two. If you were on Twitter, you saw this, but essentially the guards just like didn't know what was going on and people were like not getting inside on time. People like Paramore had started and half the crowd was still outside the venue. They were just like, no crowd control, no organization, just like hot mess express. And I just think like, if you're going to a show at the magnitude of a festival, the Eras tour, even if you're going to a basement show that has 30 people in attendance, they have to, there's got to be some organization to it because that's what takes the fun out of concerts. When it is like a mess and a disaster and you can't just show up, have fun, have a drink, hang out, especially a festival when you're outside all day long or the Eras tour, you're outside for three and a half, almost four hours, like at the show in between sets, whatever it is, like it's a long day. And to have that kind of like stress and annoyance for the Eras tour instance, like before you even get in and at Boston Calling on the last day, like the third day is where things go wrong. That's like just supposed to be your golden day. You know what I mean? Like Saturday, Friday, Saturday, excuse me, are supposed to be like, oh shit, like let's fix anything that went wrong. So Saturday or Sunday will be good. How did Sunday go so wrong if Friday, Saturday was fine? The only thing I can think of is the fact that like you oversold tickets because you knew people would buy them. Seems a little weird, a little fishy. Again, I don't, I wasn't there. I don't know, but just, you know, a little, a little weird, a little peculiar that this all went down. <laughs> and I'm just like, what, in what world, especially at a stadium when like Boston Calling, I can understand to an extent because the grounds it's on isn't obviously a festival or concert every weekend, but a stadium is built to host people for a sporting event, a concert, whatever it may be. And for security to not be able to handle or know how to get everybody in in an orderly fashion. And maybe it was the fans acting awry and, you know, doing whatever. But like, there's got to be some way for them to organize this better. I, again, with Taylor, I think everybody was able to like get in. They hold, they held Taylor's set a little bit to make sure everybody could get in for it. Because I can't even imagine the chaos it would cause if that was the instance and people weren't inside for Taylor. But like, that sucks. Imagine going to a show, especially like Paramore was opening and you don't get in for it. Mm -mm, I would have raised hell. You would have heard from my people, which is just me. But that being said, <laughs> just some concert talk, you know, some fun, fun little chit chat before we hop into some other news, which actually is still kind of concert related. <laughs> Lady Gaga has released her Chromatica Ball HBO special and I, oh, I'm not okay. I'm literally... I'm putting my paws up because God, I love this bitch so much. So if you didn't see, didn't hear, Lady Gaga had a premiere last week for Chromatica Ball, the special that came out on HBO Max. Yes, the tour was two years ago. Yes, the album came out four years ago. No, I don't know why we're still in this era, but you know what? I will take it in a world where pop stars like to cycle through eras as if it's like their dirty laundry cycle. I'm kind of here for a four year long era milk it out gaga do your thing but so she had a premiere last week for the concert special on hbo which i did get to go to that concert back in it had to be like august of 2022 ish sounds right and it was like any gaga show i've ever been to just out of control so if you didn't get a chance to see the show or if you want to relive it go check that out on hbo max but at the premiere there were two big things to take away uh three actually excuse me 
first and foremost, Lady Gaga is dressing weird again, and I am so happy. She is dressing like 2009, 2010 Lady Gaga, just like weird, funky, not like this LinkedIn era, boring, rest in peace, but Tony Bennett and like, you know, the Vegas jazz ensemble thing, which... I, I, I know why she did it. I appreciate it. She's so talented. Whatever. I'm not going to keep defending myself. But you you want Lady Gaga to be Lady Gaga. You know what I mean? And Chromatica definitely was a little... It definitely came back to those, like, those roots. But she was still doing, like, A Star is Born and The Vegas Thing and Tony Bennett and this and that. So, like, to fully have Gaga back doing just, like, her weird rah-rah pause-up shit oh i'm so here for it and i'm so excited she also somebody asked her on the carpet about telephone part two and she said whenever beyonce calls i like to pick up which to me means like they're talking about it and she didn't say if beyonce calls i'll pick up she said when beyonce calls i like to pick up alluding to the fact that like she's picked up the call when beyonce called right like am i crazy i think like, I feel like we're getting close to Telephone Part 2. I think they're finally getting some sense knocked into them. And they're finally going to do it. Which, we will be clowning for Telephone Part 2 until the day we die, I fear. But, like, I will take any crumb of them doing another collab together. I I am a <laughs> Telephone Part 2 truther. I will... The day that that gets released, if and when, call an ambulance for me. Do a pulse check. Like, I will need it. It's going to be big. Telephone is literally, like, probably the biggest collab, realistically, of, like, two artists that we've had in a very long time. And it was 2009, so long ago. So, like, we're ready for part two. It has been some time. And Gaga, I don't know. I don't know. Her choice of wording was a little peculiar for my liking. So, I guess we will see what comes of that. But you know, they also do love to lie and just like lead us on. So we'll see. But she did give that little tidbit, which was fun. And then the third thing is she's in a little bit of heat right now um, because she admitted to doing five shows with having COVID. She did say everybody on the crew was allowed to take the day if they needed it. Like they did if they didn't feel comfortable, but she didn't want to cancel the shows. And I'm I don't know how I feel because at one part of me, I'm like, OK, well, like, that's crazy to do shows with COVID. I've had COVID twice, I want to say, maybe three times. Luckily, I'm vaccinated and I was a-okay in the clear. Like, I didn't really have that bad of symptoms. And I'm sure Gaga is the same way. But, like, to per I can imagine going on stage and performing with that. Absolutely not. So I'm surprised she didn't cancel it. I don't think it's anything worth canceling her for. People are, like, really mad about this. And I get it. Sure. But I mean, like, we are four years past the pandemic. I think, like, we can let go of things that happened in the past. And if you can't, that's on you. There's much bigger things happening in the world right now. And I think the fact that, like, people are getting caught up in Lady Gaga having COVID for five shows, like, is it right? No, absolutely not. But she wasn't, like, meeting and greeting people. She wasn't in the crowd. Like, it's not like she was, like, going in like singing to people and whatever she was on stage doing her thing i i can see being like raising a brow at it but i think the people who are like genuinely trying to stir something up from it really need to like go touch some grass and like it happened it's in the past we it's it we've gone on from it i don't know it was just like a weird people like to cling to things and like not let them go and i feel like this is going to be one of those things that like continues to be brought up and i'm just like let's nip it in the butt now while we can but also why did she admit that i don't know it was just like a weird <laughs> very weird thing for her to do but again it's lady gaga she's gonna say whatever she wants do whatever she wants it is what it is but in bigger gaga news because yes it gets bigger at the end of this documentary the last scene she plays a clip from an unreleased song and then it just flashes on the screen LG7 Gaga returns. I mean, come on. Oh my God, I'm so excited. And this just seems like a fun way to kind of like end the last era, start the new one. And it was such like a quick way to do it, but it was so prominent on the screen when it flashed that you couldn't have missed it even if you wanted. Like you, even if you looked away for a second, it just had that like the effects on the screen that just, it stuck with you. The videos of people watching it at like premiere parties and freaking out, I'm living for. This era of Gaga sounds 
very good. I am very excited. My paws are up. I am, I'm seated. I am ready. I am, ugh, I cannot wait. I will buy anything Gaga sells. I am ready for a new Gaga era. Oh, I cannot wait. And speaking of somebody else who another era that I am very excited for that is being teased, Miss Katy Perry. So these are the two releases I was talking about at the top of the show that we would get back to. Katy is like fully coming back, full swing. She is saying that this might be the song of the summer. It might be the biggest hit of her career. You guys know I love me some Katy. I literally could go on and on about Teenage Dream for hours, but also just like she has a killer discography. Say what you want. Say she had a flop era. Say this, say that. I don't really care. I love Katie. I am very excited for whatever she is cooking up. There's this whole 143 theme about it. So people keep thinking she's going to announce it at like 143 Eastern. Doesn't happen. And then 143 Pacific time comes. Doesn't happen. So who knows when we're getting the announcement? Who knows when it's going to be released? But we are getting music from everyone this year. And it is as overwhelming as it is. I keep just getting like, Oh my god, we're getting a new Lady Gaga album, a new Katy Perry album, we got Beyonce, we got Ariana, we got Taylor, we got Casey Musgrave. Like, we are getting so much music this year. It's so exciting. But yes, Katy and Gaga, whenever you are ready to release these singles, these albums, I am ready. I am welcoming you with open gay arms. My limpy wrists are prepared and ready for whatever you have in store for us. 2009 is so back and I am so Oh, I cannot wait. I'm so, I'm stoked. That being said, as another era that I am very excited that has not ended yet, Ariana Grande is teasing the Boy Is Mine music video and it's coming out June 7th, so next Friday. And it kind of has a Gossip Girl theme, which also leads to people believing that Penn Badgley is the love interest in the music video. Now, I loved Gossip Girl. I mean, I love it. It didn't go anywhere, but I love Gossip Girl. I love Ariana Grande, and if she has Penn Badgley in this music video, I, she, ugh, we got to give it up for Ariana Grande. She does so many things well, but music videos specifically, she always nails it. Whether it's sticking to a theme, sticking to a reference, getting a major name in a music video. I mean, Evan Peters and We Can't Be Friends. She had Jennifer Coolidge in Thank You Next. Like, she just is always pulling Chris Jenner and thank you next like she is always pulling these people and these references and these fully thought out music video concepts which we don't really get anymore sometimes some music videos are just like go look pretty go shake some ass on a set and like call it a day Ariana Grande is always ready to perform put on a killer music video and I'm so excited as you guys know Eternal Sunshine is absolutely my favorite Ariana Grande project I think it is it is her best body of work to me. And I just think like the fact that she is continuing to give us more from this era. Thank God. Because if she ended it quick and just like nipped it and went right full swing into Wicked, I would have been pissed. <laughs> this album is so good. Cannot wait for this. Allegedly, there's three more singles after this. And I, please let this era go on as long as you would like girly pop because this era is fantastic. And I'm so excited for this new music video. So more about that. Not next week, the week after. Yes. Yes, the week after because it's the seventh. And that's how math works. <laughs> Moving on to our next story. And I will let me brace you guys because it's a bit of an abrupt pivot, a little aggressive. So uh gird your loins, buckle up, because our next story is definitely um switch of the gears. But if you did not see on Instagram Live, <laughs> Nicki Minaj was arrested over the weekend. So she was trying to fly from Amsterdam to Manchester for her the next stop of her Pink Friday 2 tour. And officials, I guess they were tipped off to the fact that she had drugs in her bag. They had searched the bags, it ended up just being some pre-rolls. So they had to come and weigh them, I guess, just to make sure that she was flying with the legal amount. I think the, the illegal part of it all is that she was flying to another country with them. I don't think the actual possession of it is the issue. I could be wrong, but that's kind of what I was understanding because she was in Amsterdam, which like, isn't that their thing? Isn't that what they're known for? Like, right? I'm not crazy for thinking that. Um, but so they did end up taking her into custody. She was released later that night. She was fined 350 euros, which is about $380 in US currency and about 38 cents to Nicki Minaj. So the fine isn't really the big deal. I think the bigger deal is the fact that like, how did they know they were in her bag? But my question is like, what made her think to go on Instagram live 
while this is all happening. Now, and again, I understand the climate for people of color, women of color, really anybody of color, especially with drug charges, because people can get, unfortunately, things can get dicey. And I'm not, you know, that is not, not my story to tell. I totally understand. Do what makes you feel safest. But she was getting on a private jet. So it wasn't like she was like at an airport in handcuffs, making a scene like she was literally at a private airport and they stopped her. They checked her bag. I don't know what the protocol is. Spoiler, I don't fly private, so <laughs> I don't really know what the whole process of getting on the plane is, or the jet rather, but it is very weird that they knew that there was something in her bag. So she went on Twitter, she decided to take things into her own hands, as she does, and decide to start just like going at it and saying people are trying to sabotage her tour, this must be somebody I used to work with, telling them it was in my bag, like just the whole nine of like looking for reasons as to like why it wasn't her fault, which like... I mean, Nicki Minaj really does live in her own fantasy land, which is fine. Do your thing. It's gotten you this far, Miss Minaj. But it was, I was like, why are we on Instagram Live? It was giving Jen Shaw outside of Beauty Lab on Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. Like, Nicki Minaj getting arrested on Instagram Live was literally the same thing as Jen Shaw outside of Beauty Lab on Real Housewives. I was like, where history is repeating itself. And I, I, it was as much as I wanted to look away, I couldn't. I couldn't stop watching this Instagram live to be like, what's going to happen to Nikki? Is she going to make it to Manchester? Is she making it to her next show? What's going on? What about the barbs in London? Like, what are they supposed to do? <laughs> she did have to cancel her show. She ended up postponing it, I think, to next month. So not too far. Definitely disappointing just on all parts. But just like a very, not a headline that I expected to see in 2024, especially not with on Instagram live tacked onto it. You know what I mean? Like Nicki Minaj getting arrested would definitely be like, whoa, why? Like, what the hell? Like, what did she do? But Nicki Minaj gets arrested on Instagram live was definitely a headline that was not on my 2024 bingo card. But alas, expect the unexpected. She is out. She is good. Again, she paid her fine. She did her thing. But definitely, definitely weird. And she did say that they're going to take this to court and get, you know, some legal teams involved so i'm curious to see how this comes because she now does have all of this on record so really any misstep on either side's part you know she could have said something wrong they could have done something wrong really could have it could make or break any case that she's trying to build so curious to see how this turns out i guess we will we will wait and see but until then we you know we're we're very just we're just very glad that nikki is safe she is okay she is out she ended up going to talk to some of the bar beside of her hotel in amsterdam and just chatting with them maybe manchester i don't really know regardless she's fine she was literally back on instagram live four hours later after she was out live tweeting the whole thing like she is okay just like very a very interesting headline to read this weekend. <laughs> Shifting gears into some TV recap for the week, The Kardashians are back. Season five has premiered on Hulu and they packed a lot into this first episode. I feel like they were like, how can we pack the biggest punch and just like give the girls what they want and they delivered. <laughs> so the episode starts out and we do hear some more about Courtney's pregnancy, which if you're not following her, she did have a lot of trouble getting pregnant. And then she had a procedure while she was pregnant, which is just like, insane in and of itself like the fact that the doctor was able to do a procedure on the baby while Courtney was still carrying the baby is just like science that my brain cannot comprehend but we did get some more insight into that procedure she said she wasn't able to stand for more than 20 minutes she couldn't drive essentially she was stuck in her house for most of her pregnancy which yes she is Courtney Kardashian so she probably was waited on hand and foot but still like any carrying woman with that kind of like knowing like oh I can't leave my house I can't stand up because like it's for the baby like that's got to be terrifying no matter how much money you have so I was honestly really surprised that she gave us that much insight into the pregnancy and gave us that much info as if that wasn't enough she also gets COVID the morning of her baby shower so her and Travis both get COVID Chris throws a crazy baby shower which if you know me you know that I love any type of party for a celebrity baby showers are not excluded from that and this shower did not disappoint like kicking off the season with a party for a child this was this was for me this was they they must have listened to my episode two weeks ago and been like oh andrew wants more parties we're gonna give him parties and they decked this baby shower out to no end it was so insane 
the Disneyland Quartet, they had the Mickey ears, Mickey pretzels, like, it was insane. It was truly nuts. And of course, the morning of, they get COVID. So like, just, of course, what else would happen? <laughs> um, we also, this actually, I have a bone to pick. I have a bone to pick with the fact that like, Kim's only storyline is the fact that she works too much. All she talks about is how she works too much and how she is never going to talk bad about Kanye to her kids. There's really nothing else. And as much as I love her, they could literally never make me hate Kim Kardashian. I'm just like, how many seasons are we going to go with you talking about how you don't stop working? We understand. We get it. And you have the money and lifestyle to show for the fact that you don't stop working. Can we get a different storyline? Like, oh my god. I, <laughs> as much as I love seeing it, and like I do love the behind the scenes of Skims and when she like directed the fashion show that one season, I love to see it. But I'm just like, can we have something else? Is it always going to be about work? Like I get nobody wants to get their ass up and work these days. But like, can you sit your ass down and not work for one season and just exist like it's it's getting to a point where i'm like every single time there's a kim scene it's about work and it's it's crazy i don't know if she's trying to prove herself or trying to like make a different name for herself after the divorce whatever it is again they can never make me hate you but like there's got to be a new storyline and actually i'm gonna piggyback off of that while we're talking about kim kardashian and let's talk about her daughter for a second miss northwest because if you did not see miss northy did star in the hollywood bowls production of i guess the lion king's 30th anniversary over the weekend and people are mad and i just think it's nothing to get that mad over like there are full-on theater parents on tiktok right now complaining that Kim Kardashian was able to pull some strings and get Northwest to be Simba in this production over their child. And I get it. I understand the frustration. Your child is probably classically trained. Your child's probably very talented. Like, I, I'm not discrediting it. But like, if your child was Simba, we would not be talking about this 30th anniversary performance they did of The Lion King at the Hollywood Bowl. I'm sorry. Like, I understand the frustration and I understand that like nepotism is a is a very prominent thing, especially when you're Northwest. But at the end of the day, like maybe your kid's audition tape wasn't that great. Like maybe there's a reason your kid didn't get the role and it's not because Northwest got it. I'm sure it plays a factor. There's only one role and Northwest got it, not your child. But like, did you ever do some reflection and think like, oh, maybe that audition tape sucked. Maybe like, Maybe you need to look inward and not be so mad that a that Northwest got the role over your child. Like it's it's I just think like the backlash that these people get gets crazy. And I'm not even like somebody who like dies for the Kardashians. I love them and like again like I watch the seasons. I do my thing, but like I can admit when they're wrong and I can admit their wrongdoings. But I think like the reaction to Northwest being Simba in this is the craziest thing. And it's coming mostly from adults, which is typically how it happens. But like, why are you getting on TikTok and bitching and complaining? They didn't get the role. It happens. Like that is the theater business. If you are getting into theater with your child and like you want your child to be a performer, whether you're pushing it on them or they want to do it themselves, you're going to have to digest the fact that like people are going to get parts because of who their parents are. I mean, look at Beanie Feldstein. Hello, like it's going to happen. You, It's just something you kind of have to like deal with and gather, get over it and get the next audition tape ready or you're going to bitch and moan on TikTok like you're doing. So that was just uh, a weird little subtopic of the internet this week that I was like, people need, like get over it. You'll you'll be all right. Like you're, you're okay. You'll be fine. <laughs> um, and then we also see that Tristan is not leaving. The fact that he is still at her house and now lives across the street she kind of brought it upon herself like she kind of did this to herself but she really like she's got to set a boundary come on she's got to set a boundary and like be like dude you cannot be around me all the time she's never going to be able to live and enjoy her life if her ex-husband were they even married her ex whatever is always around like it is it's the weirdest dynamic it's so bizarre does he not have anything else to do does he not have anything else to go out and like a hobby, work, anything. It, it. I don't know. 
She's better than me. She is better than me. And what better way to round out the Kardashian recap than with Scott Disick's Manjaro product placement in his fridge. If you did not see, when Scott opened his fridge, there literally the whole scene is him talking about how he's so healthy, he's on his health grind, he's eating right, he looks great, he's lost all this weight. He opens his fridge and in the little butter compartment is literally two boxes of Manjaro, which like, good for you, bitch. I almost feel like it was put there purposely for people to be like, oh, no shit, he's using this. But at the same time, I'm like, do we think that was an accident? Like, do you think that the editors just like didn't catch it? I don't know. Felt weird, but also like, I love it. I'm the first person to tell anybody, if you need a semaglutide to lose weight, if you need any of these drugs to like help you, do it. I don't, I don't, the stigma behind them, I think it is so stupid. You wouldn't tell a depressed person not to take antidepressants. Why would you tell somebody who can't lose weight to not take a medicine to help them lose weight? Whether they need it or not. Why are you worried about it? Why do you care? I don't know, but good for you, Scott. Keep it up. Do your thing. And that's the Kardashians. <laughs> and moving to our final part of the TV recap, it is another day in the workroom and RuPaul's Drag Race Season 9 is alive and well. And this week, we're playing the Snatch Game. Not just any Snatch Game, the Snatch Game of Love, which how do we feel about the Snatch Game of Love? Because I always dread it until it happens. And I'm like, actually, I kind of like this for All Stars. When they start the episode, I'm like, come on, I just want a normal snatch game. I just want it to be, you know, sit up on the thing, make a joke, make Rue laugh. It is what it is. We don't need this extra added element to it. And then whenever they do it, I'm like, okay, wait, actually, I do. I like this. So <laughs> I need to remember that next time they do Snatch Game of Love. So Snatch Game of Love, we come to find out that Monet Exchange and Raja are the ones looking for love this season, which I love that. I love that it was like a tie-in, obviously, with two major drag race queens. Um, so let's get into these impersonations. So just as a refresher, I'll go through the list of everybody who they played, and then we'll go through like my thoughts on each of them. So the first group was with Monet. It was Angeria as Marla Gibbs, Roxy Andrews as Tasha Salad, Chanel as Liberace, and Georges as John Leguizamo. The second group was with Raja. We had Vanjie as Cleopatra, Nina West as Liberace as well, Plastic Tiara as Ali Wong, and Gottmik as Pal, the dog that played Lassie. So let's get into it. Angeria hilarious. Her mannerisms, her jokes, literally the first thing out of her mouth, RuPaul laughed at. She was good from the jump. She was funny from the beginning. She carried it through. She is hilarious. You guys know that is my little Southern Belle. I love her. Uh, Roxy playing Tasha Salad, which if you don't know, is her character that she played in a challenge on season five. Doing a callback to yourself is one of the most iconic things you can really do on Drag Race. This was no exception. I thought this was so funny. Such a smart choice. I loved it. Chanel playing Liberace. So now Chanel and Nina West both bringing Liberace is kind of crazy because how do they both bring somebody who's never been done and both bring it the exact same season? I was like, oh, I thought somebody was going to budge. I did think somebody was going to cave and like let one of them take it over the other and bring like a backup. But I kind of live for the fact that we got two of the same impersonations, two different groups, and they just kind of like did it in their own way. They both did fabulous. First and foremost, they both did such a good job, but it really shined through in like, like, I feel like Chanel's looked more like Liberace and was more like true to the character, where Nina brought that more funniness to it, you know, that Nina West does. Nina West is an is a acting queen. Like she could make anything funny, I fear. So like it was no no surprise that she was funnier in it. But Chanel was so good as Liberace. I loved it. Georges was John Lugazama, which was essentially just Georges being Georges. Like it wasn't anything crazy. I It was funny when it was, but it wasn't like groundbreaking. I, I think, I don't know. It is what it is. <laughs> like, I think Georges gets very comfortable doing Georges. And not that it's a bad thing because I love Georges, but I was just like, you could have done something. I feel like it could have been a better, she could have picked somebody better for her. But hey, who am I? I'm not on Drag Race. I can't say. Vanjie with Cleopatra. She was essentially Vanjie with a Cleopatra wig on. Vanjie's hilarious. We don't know much about Cleopatra's personality, but like, I don't know if her and Vanjie would be kikiing at the club. But you know what? Vanjie's hilarious. Whether she's in a Cleopatra wig, a Marilyn Monroe wig, this wig, that wig, Michelle Facade, she could do anyone. She's just funny. Was it anything to go home about? No, but it was safe. It was fun. 
it is what it is. <laughs> now, Nina West, like I said, she knocked it out of the park. I thought she was hilarious. I loved her Liberace. Plastique, on the other hand, it's kind of humbling to see her not succeed. You know what I mean? Like, she's so stunning and always knocks her runways out of the park. And she's just like so unbelievably gorgeous that when she shows a little bit of like, oh, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. Like, it's kind of almost like, okay, cool. So you're not perfect all the time. Like you do have flaws. You're, you look perfect all the time, but you're not always on your A game. And that's okay. You don't have to be good at everything, but this definitely, this was a miss for Miss Plastique. I do have to admit. And I think she's very lucky that it's a no limit elimination season. Moving on. The next thing, Got Mick. This was the real star of the show. Got Mick? Oh. Got Mick playing Pal which is the name of the dog who played Lassie and giving her, obviously we don't know what the dog sounds like, dogs don't talk, but it was a genius for Gottmik to take this obviously iconic character in Hollywood history, Lassie, and run with it and give it a personality, give it this like funniness to it. It was a perfect snatch game. I absolutely loved it. Um, I think my top would definitely have to be Gottmik, Angeria, Nina, and Chanel. I thought they all killed it. I loved the four of them. Everybody did fine. It wasn't, it was a good snatch game. Like I thought Roxy also was killer, but I mean like uh, Gottmik was really the star of the show. It was so good. More on that later. And then the runway was A Tale of Two Titties, which just like so stupid and so funny. So let's get into these looks. First and foremost, Angeria with her dragon look. She looked stunning. She looked unreal. I loved it. It was gorgeous. Roxy coming out as Roger Rabbit and Jessica Rabbit. So smart. The play on the tail of two titties. So she had the saying that is just so funny. So obviously her, the boobs were boobing, but she was also telling the tale of two characters, which I thought was genius. Obviously, Roger Rabbit is a rabbit, has a tail, but also telling Jessica Rabbit. Such a smart play on the theme of the runway. Chanel coming out as a scorpion. So Chanel has a reoccurring theme this episode of like having somebody else doing the same thing as her, which we'll get into in a second. I thought this look was really, really good, but I wish the tail would have extended and held itself up. I thought her holding the tail up the entire time kind of took away from the illusion of it. She still looked great. I mean, her makeup was always insane. The outfit was perfect, but like my one, literally the only note that I have, I wish the tail had more structure in it to hold itself up. Um, George just comes out and she has little Miss Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Did I hate it? No. Did I love it? No. It was literally it looked like a chihuahua furry costume and Georges paint on her face. Like it wasn't bad. It wasn't anything crazy. I thought it was fun for Georges. Definitely outside of her comfort zone and not something she usually would do. She usually loves to like accentuate her little body. So I do have to give her credit for doing something outside of her comfort zone and not just like putting on a, a rhinestone like outfit with pot leaves on her boobs like she did last week and like calling it a runway. So props there, but again, did not blow me away. Vanjie comes out, and again, this is the duplicate of Chanel. She's also a scorpion, but this is like if a scorpion went to Gag City. She was bright pink. She It almost looked like she had this pink outfit and just like got a pink scorpion tail made. But what I have to say, I have to give her credit, the tail held itself up. And that, to me, it just added so much more to the look. And I really wish Chanel's look would have had the tail holding itself up because it just added such an extra level to the experience and the illusion of it. That being said, both of them were fabulous. I loved both looks. Now, a look that I absolutely hated. There was nothing about this look that I liked was Nina West's comment look. I, I, I can appreciate her taking a different spin on the look and like doing something a little different. It was more of like the tale of a comet. But the taste level just is not there. And like, I don't, I don't know. She did such a good snatch game that it, she was clearly in the front runner regardless of her look. But to come out after doing a killer snatch game like that and walk the runway like that, oh, I just didn't love it. But again, it is what it is, <laughs> whatever. Somebody who didn't do great in snatch game and, you know, did great on the runway. So vice versa of Nina West, Plastique. This runway was insane. All of those tails. I love that she is really just giving us culture in every runway she does. She is fully diving into her roots and just showing us who she is and that she's proud of where she comes from, which we know that's something that she struggles with because she's talked about it before. I love that she is so willing to just like open up this season, give us a different look of her, but still look 
literally perfect. She, there's not a flaw on that woman. And I say woman because that's not even a drag queen. I feel like she is literally a woman. It's insane. I loved her look. And then truly the star of the entire show this season, Got Mick. This look was so smart, so good, so perfect. I loved it. The top surgery reference, the arms coming across, cutting off her boobs. If you don't know, Got Mick is trans, uh, female to male. And so clearly top surgery is something that you experienced when you are, you know, a trans man. And this just was such a beautiful but also fun way to just kind of like show the trans story which we don't get a lot of on drag race all the time you know it's like there were obviously our trans competitors but i feel like got make will take it to that level and just like be like hey yeah like this is here it is you know what i mean um i loved it i thought the the boobs in the bag were genius a little gruesome but i loved it the rhinestone blood coming off of the scars just so well done so genius there really was no fabric to it it was just the skirt but it didn't need anything more like it was so well done but the fact that the skirt was hospital gown colored genius i don't know if that was intentional or not i caught it i'm assuming it was intentional because she's very well thought out this look was chef's kiss perfection i Loved it. And that wraps up the runway. We come to find out that Gottmik and Nina are in the top two, which I can agree with. I do think Angeria as a full package snatch game and runway did do a better job than Nina this episode, but Nina really did knock it out of the park with her snatch game. So I'll give it to her. That's fine. What's not fine is what happened in the lip sync. She has been changing into this lip sync reveal dress every single week waiting for her to be in the top even when she knows she's not going to be in the top there were the first two episodes girl you knew you were not going to be in the top after what you presented this i understand but she wears this lip sync reveal outfit that's clearly a lip sync dress it literally said this is my lip sync dress on it and she just starts revealing layers of glittery fabric and somehow each layer got uglier and uglier and uglier and i was like if you're gonna do a reveal at least make it pretty at the end and nina's not a fashion girl I can, I can give that to her. Like, that's not her shtick, and that's fine. So do something funny. Don't do a reveal just to do a reveal. Do a reveal that's going to reveal something worth revealing. Take a shot every time I just said reveal. That being said, the judges also agreed that it wasn't great, and Gottmik wins the lip sync. They Oh, they lip sync, I'm sorry, to Banana by Anita featuring Becky G. Fun song. I'm not familiar with it, to be honest, but they did their thing up there. Gottmik does win. Gottmik is kind of the one to watch right now. This is her second win and her second. Yeah, she won the lip sync last week too. Like she is kind of the one to watch. I'm kind of, I'd be scared if I was the other girls. We come to find out that she takes the ruby red snippers and cuts off George's, which I guess makes sense because George's does have a win. So she does kind of have a leg up, no pun intended from her chihuahua look, a leg up from the other girls. Uh, but both Nina and Gottmik do get two badges this week. And next week, we do get to find out who gets their second badge. So they get to keep one for themselves and then gift one of the girls a badge. Now, one of the editors on Drag Race made a big mistake. And if you look at the preview for next week, you can clearly see who is wearing badges in the episode. I won't spoil it, but if you do want to go watch and use your fine eye, you can see who they gifted their badges to. We don't know who gifted who you know, we don't know who got Mick gave it to this person or Nina gave it to that person, but you can clearly tell that there's two people that we don't know to have a badge wearing a badge next week. So little oopsie on the editing side there, but hey, we can't be perfect all the time. And that is Drag Race for the week. I am loving this season so far. I know we're only three episodes in, but I'm very excited for where this season goes. And with that, that is the end of our show. We obviously still have my yes and my mess. So if you are new here, I end every show with my yes and my mess of the week. My yes being something that I'm loving, my mess being something that I'm not loving. And we always start on a high note. So let's kick it off with my yes, which is the Four Seasons Orlando baby. If you're not familiar, this baby went viral a few weeks ago because she, some, somebody in her family asked, who wants to go to Four Seasons Orlando? This one-year-old raises her hand and says me which like why is a one-year-old so conscious very alarming now that's not my yes of it all my yes of it all is the way that the four seasons orlando has handled this inviting them on this trip and doing this full like marketing social campaign with them they had balloons in her room that said me they gave her like a plate of pasta and just let her go to town on it the four seasons orlando marketing team is 
killing it with this social media moment. And that's somebody who works on social media. I know the amount of like organic reach that that video got them. There's no amount of sales and marketing dollars that you could buy that type of exposure for. Nothing's going to sell your brand or your business better than just like an organic, authentic video that was not planned. It just happened. Like it is a one in a million chance. And when it happens, it is, it's like a, a gold mine for any type of business because it will truly, it can make or break, like skyrocket your business. And they are taking it and running with it. I hope this family has a lifetime amount of free stays at any four seasons they want because they are they have brought such a new limelight into this business that was already super successful. They are killing it. I'm obsessed with this. I love that they are just like playing into it, having fun. And like, yes, give that baby a lifetime stay at any four seasons she wants because she is a marketing mogul. She doesn't even know it yet. <laughs> and my mess of the week, another little TikTok situation that it happened last week and I almost made it a story because I was living for it when it happened. But now I'm very over it because she has beat this into the ground and it's the Bethany Frankel Chanel. So the TLDR, if you did not see, essentially Bethany Frankel tried to go shopping in a Chanel store in Chicago. They wouldn't let her in without an appointment and she was also dressed not to the nines. The next day she decided to go dressed head to toe Chanel, walk up to the door and they did let her in without an appointment, which she then turned around and walked out, which I kind of love that she like got in, made her point and didn't even shop. She just turned around and walked out. Um, but now she has just not stopped. She has continued to talk about Chanel on TikTok. Essentially, the CEO has reached out and been like, hey, chill out, like, stop talking about us. I heard that she was banned from Chanel. And honestly, like, I understood the first two videos. Like, I got that. That was, you, you made your point. But the way that she continued to run it into the ground and just not let up, like, at the end of the day, you're still Bethany Frankel. You still have a huge platform. And you can, you own so much Chanel. You have, you've still got to go shopping. Like, it's not like, it's not like you're some like regular girl who just like is going in, whatever. Like you still have a platform and the way that you were using it, you used it to tell your message. Totally fine. You made your point. You got it across. But then to just keep beating the dead horse, it just seemed like a little over the top. And I love Bethany. Don't get me wrong. I, I do. I know she's controversial. People don't love her because she's a little opinionated and this and that. And like, she is annoying, but like, so am I. So I, that, I like her. This is just like, she, I, I, I hope she's done. I haven't seen her post about it in a few days. I think she got her Memorial Day weekend in and she was like, let me just take a breather. And now she's good. But it was, it, it was a lot. There was like 15, maybe 20 videos that she posted just about Chanel within like a three day period. Like it got a little out of hand. And I, I think she's right. She's, you know, reeled it back in, but it, it, it got real messy real quick. <laughs> and with that, that is the end of the episode. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of Two Pop to Handle. If you like what you heard and you're listening to us as a podcast, make sure you leave us a five star rating, drop a review, let me know what you're thinking. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the bell. Uh, leave a comment, hit the like. God, YouTube has so many buttons you can click. Press them all except for dislike. <laughs> if you would like to follow us on social media, we are at Two Pop to Handle on all forms of social, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, you name it, I am there. Come follow along the journey. I'm always posting fun little memes. If you're interested in following me on socials, I am at Andrew Nucatola across all platforms. And with that, I will catch you guys next week. Bye.